If you start digging into the occult, you're opening a door. You are familiar. Who are you and why do I know you? A hint of guilt, but with an underlying scent of unearned superiority. So you're saying he's Catholic? Yes, that must be it. And you might not be strong enough to close it. And then you have to call me. Someone wrote into my show, said, Michael, if you could meet the devil. Michael, my oh, that's how I know you. You're Michael Knowles, and you show up on my YouTube shorts sometimes. You're the guy who owns the libs with facts and logic. I mean, the other guy who owns the libs with facts and logic. I mean, one of the guys who owns the libs with facts and logic. So he's obviously right, and the lib ladies are wrong. Some people would fail to follow the logic of that story to our Second Amendment rights. I mean, this, this is why even to say legalize same-sex marriage, you can't, even if I wanted to legalize same-sex marriage, I feel so impelled to do so, I could not do that because it is not a thing. Okay, that really, that's something, I'm just taking notes so that I don't forget any of those important arguments. <laughs> that is the best, most charitable version of the atheist's argument about the apostles, which is not very persuasive. Just Incremental love, step. Uh, it's, a lot of these guys are pretty intelligent, but sometimes intelligent people are just the dumbest people on earth. Well, I can't wait for you to say something rational and compelling. No, they might just be mentally ill or yeah. vexed by demons. Yeah. So I don't think, don't I don't think it has to be drugs. Or yeah. they're confused. Or they just don't know. They might have thought that it was. Yeah. They, yeah, they see... could be gullible. Huh. That was not what I was expecting. Yeah, I, listen, I wake up in the middle of the night and I think that I'm being probed by a little green man. <laughs> Met him twice, personally. How'd that go? Not well the first time. Baudelaire said the finest trick the devil ever played is to convince you that he does not exist. In recent days, however, He's been kind of flamboyant, wouldn't you say? Uh, he's being a little more brazen about his existence. A very interesting pig for God. It comes from a story published in the 1864 edition Le Figaro, titled Le Joyeur Généreux, or however else that's pronounced. And in that piece, Baudelaire talks about this meeting with the devil, and how the devil and God, quote, salute each other when we meet, end quote. Now, just so you know, stuff is all in French. I'm quoting from a translation, link in the description. So if the words don't completely line up with the original, that's not on me, that's on the translators. I did look at the original, but my French is way too bad to understand properly what is going on. The only thing I picked up on is that sometimes it's female and sometimes it's male when he's referring to the devil, and that's about as far as I got. Anyway, the devil talks about how he's not afraid of being vilified across the world. He claims that he only got worried once when a particular charming priest caught out that the finest trick the devil ever played is to convince you that he does not exist. And that is where the quote actually comes from. And while out of context that quote sounds as though the devil wasn't a fan of being remembered, it does somewhat contradict his claim about not being afraid of being vilified, which he mentioned before. I mean, why would you be afraid of being remembered, but not about being vilified, when you have to be remembered in order to be vilified? On top of that, a bit later in the story, the devil also says, quote, I want you to remember me always, end quote, making it sound as though he's unhappy about being forgotten, rather than being unhappy about not being forgotten. One way or another, I'm not sure Mikey Boy here has the right interpretation of the quote, is what I'm saying. I'm actually not certain he did more than just finding the quote and that he actually knows who Baudelaire is. Because our dear Baudelaire here was an artist with a soft spot for lesbians, sex and dysfunctional relationships. To the point where half of his poems read like an incense fever dream about ruthless dominatrixes. And some of his art was so over the top during his time that seven of his poems from Le Fleur du Mal, or however else you pronounce it, were censored when they were published because they were considered way too scandalous for the sensitivities of France. Let me repeat that. They were too scandalous for France, the country known for Lolita, Moulin Rouge and cuties. Now, I'm not saying that Noah didn't read Baudelaire, or shouldn't read Baudelaire, if he did. 
his erotica pics are none of my business. But what I am saying is that if he tried to sound sophisticated, especially for a man who subscribes to his particular values, then quoting the 19th century equivalent of Fifty Shades of Grey is probably not the way to go. When you look at uh, devil costumes at the Grammys, when you look at all sorts of weird Wiccan occult rituals and some of the biggest stages on earth, and yet some people still don't believe it. Don't believe what? That the devil exists and that he wants me to know that he exists? No, I don't believe that. And not only do I not believe that, I think that's a really bad strategy for the devil to undertake if he did exist. Because if he convinces me that he exists, he opens the door to convince me that God exists. And that seems like it would be counterproductive to whatever his goals are with me and my soul. Now, maybe him revealing himself is not so much a strategy, but merely an indicator of his confidence. He can prance about in the open, and dense idiots like me will refuse to see the obvious that's staring them in the face. But if he is just being cocky, isn't he going to lose souls on the margins by engaging in this behavior? Surely there are some non-believers who, when presented with evidence of the devil would become believers. Also, if he's being flamboyant, doesn't that encourage existing believers, like you, to spread messages, like your video, in order to encourage people to shape up and change their ways? Whatever his motivation is, this behavior just isn't smart. And I thought the devil was supposed to be smart. Now, unfortunately for me, I don't see evidence of the devil. I see evidence of celebrities being edgy for attention. And that's not a new phenomenon. If the devil's existence is such a readily apparent fact, however, then your job at convincing people of it should be really easy. We are joined today, very fortunately, by Father Dan Rehill, not only a Catholic priest, but the exorcist here in Nashville. Just out of curiosity, did the number of possessed people increase or decrease since the arrival of the exorcist? People tend to like the political commentary that focuses on the day-by-day -day policy, and then the culture, and then even sometimes the spiritual stuff that underpins it. The most pushback I ever get is when I mention demons when I mention things like the devil. People stop me, they say, Michael, now you're getting fantastical. Now you're getting crazy. You're talking about things that don't exist. Hmm, you know, if you want people to take this demon idea a bit more serious, then it would probably be a good idea to start to have a proper definition. Maybe let's start there. That would be very helpful, at least for me, because so far I've heard about everything unpleasant being referred to as demons, which isn't really helpful. You know, people you dislike, Demons. Closer is like demonic. People who don't share your faith? Demons. Bad habits and lack of self-control? Demons. The noisy kids of the neighbors? Demons. The ex? Demon. The hot chick who says no? Demon. The hot chick who says yes, but she also says yes to your best friend? Also demon. That weird child behind the chair after your fifth joint? Definitely a demon. This is pretty much my experience of how the word is used. And I think that that sort of wish wash everything nothing definition is really, really confusing and unscientific. As your colleague Matt Walsh would say, How can I possibly be talking about a thing that has no meaning and no definition? This is, this is, inc it becomes incoherent babble. So what is your definition of demon? But these things do exist. No? No definition? Nothing? <sighs> Fine. They do. I mean, if you're a Christian, any Christian, and you follow the scriptures, we know there was a war in heaven, and Lucifer, the most brilliant and the most beautiful of the angels, rebelled because of the plan for the Son, the Word, to become flesh. And he was horrified that God would lower himself to our nature. And so he said, I will not serve. And he was cast out with his minions, and they became the fallen angels, the demons, and they were cast down to earth. And soon thereafter, Eve encountered the serpent, and that was the beginning of our demise. Okay, well, how brilliant exactly is Lucifer, 
if he thought he could win a rebellion against God. And you mean to tell me he was appalled at the notion of God lowering himself and becoming man, but not appalled at the notion of disobeying God? He thinks so highly of God that he's offended at the notion of God reducing himself to that of a mere mortal, but he doesn't think so highly of God that he thinks God's plan would work or have any merit to it whatsoever. But maybe that's not the correct characterization of Satan. I don't really know what you're going for, you're not very clear. But maybe it's not that he thought so highly of God he was appalled at the notion of God lowering himself. Maybe he was appalled at the notion of serving a being that would lower themselves in that manner. In this case, the motivation for the rebellion was not offense born out of reverence for God, but pride. And if that's the case, why did God create a being that was so antithetical to his own nature? God is maximally humble. He's a supreme being willing to take on the form of a lesser being. Lucifer is maximally prideful. He's a lesser being willing to disobey and rebel against a supreme being. Why would God do this? Why would God create a being he knew would rebel against him? What was the purpose of this exercise? This seems like it accomplished nothing other than contribute to the fall of man. Also, is the chronology of this correct? God came up with the plan to forgive humanity of sin before the inception of sin. Do you then accept that God is, in fact, the source of sin? If you're God, and you set up the dominoes of the universe and you know exactly how they're going to fall, and you have set those dominoes up in such a way that you can see well in advance that sin is going to exist, and that you're going to need to absolve humans of it, how are you not therefore responsible for sin? And so this is not um, mythical. This is fact. The devil is a real person, a person in the sense of having a will and an intellect. Um, he's a spirit, but he's a person. and. What you said is true, that he used to be very hidden, and he used to be very subtle, and it should worry people that he's suddenly not worried about being seen, hmm. because that means it's what most people would deduct from that is that he realizes that his reign is coming to a close, and he's using everything he has now to try to drag as many people down with him so we can be miserable in hell too. Wasn't that always his plan within Christian theology? That he reigns in hell. I don't know what you mean by his reign is coming to an end. Surely he's going to continue reigning in hell. But anyway, so he's in hell, and his goal is to bring as many of us down there with him as he can. If being flamboyant about his existence was a good way of doing that, surely he would have been doing that from the outset. A consistent character flaw of the devil seems to be that his plans are not very well thought out or consistent. Now, something I find interesting is that you think the devil's plan is logical, at least from the devil's perspective. And since the devil is a character you created, well, it's a character your religion created, but still, that leads me to believe that either you or your religion, or both, are not very logical or consistent. And so this is not um, mythical, this is fact. You know, knowing the story and believing it's true are two different things. And believing that there's a spat between Lucifer and God doesn't really imply that there are actual real-life demons running about us either. I remember the Pope stating at some point that the seven-day creation in Genesis is meant to be metaphorical. Why wouldn't Catholics genuinely believe that this story is also metaphorical? I'm sorry, but you can't just assert things and not give us any reason to take your assertion seriously and then expect us to take it seriously. And what you said is true, that he used to be very hidden and he used to be very subtle. And it should worry people that he's suddenly not worried about being seen. Seen where? You mentioned people dressing up and having wicca signs and dancing about and sort of having a few screws loose, which... Not much of a novelty there. But people dressing up as devils don't mean that there actually is a devil. Kind of like when you see dudes dressing themselves up like chicks, that doesn't mean that they're actually- ah! There! No! 
now it has a stack. And how is Wiccan even remotely devil related? The pagan origins far far predate Christianity in Europe. Not even close in fact. And okay, you could say that the modern version is kind of a hipster thing, but so is the modern version of Christianity if we're honest. So that is not much of an argument either. Sorry buddy, but it takes more than confusing a bunch of random LARPers with the actual devil to prove your point. Now, what do you say to people who say that's a nice story, Father, but I don't believe that the Bible is anything more than a collection of stories that have influenced the culture. I don't believe there was any such thing as Satan falling from heaven. Mm. I don't believe in Adam and Eve. I don't believe anyone bit the apple. I don't believe in original sin. I don't believe in the personification of evil. I don't believe in evil, period. I think we're basically just a bunch of meat sacks, and all of our uh, conceptions of these things are just chemicals firing off in our brain, and you can't convince me otherwise. You have more or less described me. Now, perhaps there's some room to quibble over what is meant by evil or evil existing, but within the margin of error, I'd say you have summed up my position, except when you say, can't convince me otherwise. That doesn't describe me. You can convince me. You push me closer to believing what you believe when you present me with evidence and arguments that I find compelling. Oh, well, yeah, you're a non-believer. Yes, Father. I'm a non-believer, and I'm asking you to present me with reasons to think that what you're saying is true. What do you have for me? <laughs> so, good luck. Boy, Padre, you sure are great at winning hearts and minds. But that's it. If you don't believe, I, I can't make you believe. Hmm. But that's your decision. How is it that the devil can be so persuasive, but you can't be? Doesn't the devil lie and you have truth on your side and here i come a starving man begging for a cup of truth and you have nothing to offer me also how exactly is it your decision when you're deprived of half of the story let us say for the sake of argument that there is a guy let's call him baby logi oh cute and baby logi was raised in a completely secular household meaning he wasn't exposed to your religion whatsoever or maybe he heard of Christianity fleetingly, and just like every other religion, there is not really much contact with it. In that particular case, it's not really a matter of baby logic doesn't believe, but a matter of baby logic has no idea what he's even supposed to believe, according to you at least, and why, if anything at all. Just because you take it for granted that everything in the world is based on your worldview, that doesn't mean that that actually is the case or that other people are even properly aware of your actual worldview. <sighs> let, let, me, let, let me see if I find an example. Um, think of informed consent, all right? If I had a sickness, let's say, and there would be a super awesome cure, and this cure happens to have a side effect of turning me purple. If I were to go to a doctor and the doctor wouldn't inform me of either, not the cure and not the side effect, then me not taking the cure wouldn't be me not consenting to the purple side effect because I wouldn't even know about the side effect of the cure, because I wouldn't know about the cure in the first place. You can sit there and be like, yeah, it's your choice. But all that does is allow you to stick to your dogma without putting in the effort to act upon it. In other words, I'm calling you lazy. And I would say you better really dig into what you believe a little more deeper before you make your final decision. I've not made a final decision. I don't fit Michael's mold. I can be convinced otherwise. Convince me otherwise. Because think about the consequences. If you're right, no harm at the end of life. I would beg to differ. I don't think that that is necessarily true. If the Bible was accurate and there would be a God and a devil and you would end up in either camp depending on what kind of choices you made, that would not necessarily tell you how that would pan out. Especially considering that there is a God-inspired version of what happened, but not a devil-inspired version. And even in God's own version, we can easily see that he isn't really the most apt at anger management, to put it mildly. What if you are right, and there is a heaven and a hell and a God and a devil, and you end up in heaven and then find out that it is not in fact super awesome, but a tightly controlled tyranny? 
whereas the devil's place would have been far more lenient and far more fun, but you refused it because of the misinformation spread by the heaven's ministry of truth. You would have been right about what you thought about heaven and hell, except that you would still have made a worse choice. You guys take an awful lot of stuff for granted and are surprised that others don't, and I don't understand why. If you're wrong, you spend eternity separated from God. That would be a lot to risk. How often do you stay up at night worrying about eternal separation from Allah? How often are you gripped with fear over what you're going to reincarnate as? And are you not at all worried about the color of your chi? So just on basic common sense, it would be good to like do your research a little deeper before you come to the conclusion like, I don't... Just out of curiosity, how deep is deep enough? And what would you have to read or watch or listen or otherwise inhale to satisfy the requirement of done the research? What if you did all the research you could possibly do in a lifetime and everything you found would still make you genuinely conclude that this whole devil and demon idea is wrong? Is there an actual standard or is it merely uh, research until you get the results that I got because that's the right one? Because hmm? I would say, you don't believe, but do you really understand? Have you done any investigation into this? Have you read? Have you researched? Have you looked? Read what book? Research what topics? No? No answer? You're not giving me much to work with, buddy. Okay, are you asking me to do research, or are you asking me to feel threatened by Pascal's wager? Because being threatened by Pascal's wager is not research. I've done research to the extent that it's possible for me to do so, and my conclusion is your claims are woefully unsubstantiated. At First of all, there's so many miracles in the church, just the Eucharistic miracles. Yep. They baffle NASA. They can't figure out how they were done. And by, for, for people who are not so Catholic, a Eucharistic miracle. The Eucharistic miracle would be in the course of a Mass when the body and blood of Jesus is transfigured from bread and wine. Now, during the Mass, we can't see that, but we believe it. <sighs> yeah, uh, bread and wine turned into body and blood of a human that people then eat and drink. Nothing cannibalistic there. It is funny that you mention it, however, because this is one of the first things that made me rather suspicious about this whole faith business. You get edible paper and you're told, this is the body of Christ. And you get, uh, I mean, don't get wine, because that's only for the priest. And so you get told that this is the blood of Christ and you gotta take it at face value because that's as far as you get. And aside from it clearly not being true, it was edible paper, not meat, never mind human meat, I remember also constantly asking myself, why the hell we would be told to eat our own messiah? It had a very vampire zombie style vibe to it. It was pretty damn creepy. But on occasion, to bolster the faith of, of the Catholic community, the Lord will actually allow the appearance and the um, accidents, you would call them, to be changed into the body and blood as well, which means the host starts bleeding and dripping human blood, male blood, from a man of Middle Eastern descent. And the host becomes the flesh, the cardiac muscle of, of, of a heart that's been horribly beaten and assaulted. Why is that an on occasion sort of thing? Surely if doing this would bolster the faith of the congregation, and it is infinitely trivial for God to do because God is omnipotent, he would be doing this all the time. That wouldn't be a subversion of our free will. That would be evidence. Why does even your God so diligently abstain from presenting evidence? Now, about these Eucharistic miracles, what exactly is it that you presented to NASA that baffled them so badly? Did you present them a wafer that transfigured into human flesh and blood before their eyes and they could not explain that? Or did you present them human blood and then they tested it and then they told you, yeah, that's human blood? Because I suspect the truth is much closer to what I described in the latter case, and that's much less impressive. And still has white blood cells, even weeks after it's being tested. That's not explainable. So you'd have to say, how does that happen? I agree, Monsignor Exorcist. Weird things do have to be properly explained. 
For example, while white blood cells don't survive long on their own, they can, under the right conditions, be preserved for several years. The USDA even has a protocol for it. In fact, the white blood cell cryopreservation protocol. Link in the description. You carefully cool down the cells and then freeze them in liquid nitrogen. Unfortunately, you don't give me a lot of information, but assuming that there was indeed blood or other stuff brought to the lab and that the lab was tasked with preserving it, that lab might have very likely taken these kinds of steps to keep the sample as close to the original condition as possible. Because not doing so would be considered negligence. <laughs> as you see, that is a possible and rather straightforward explanation for your question since it doesn't really require any sort of extraordinary fiddling or meddling or other sort of stuff, but merely the assumption that people know how to do their job. And if we are supposed to accept meddling by a conscious agent as the explanation for whatever test result you want me to accept, why would I assume the conscious agent was God as opposed to a motivated scientist or lab assistant? Fraud, as an explanation for test results, could be ruled out if this was a test we could repeat over and over again. But per your own account, God doesn't see fit to give us many samples. Now, as Eseth pointed out, no meddling is required to explain your example miracle away. But you do know that miracle hoaxes occur. Don't tell me that divine intervention is more likely than human dishonesty. But since we're talking about proper explanations... Monsignore, how about I get to ask a few explanations from you? How exactly did they determine that it was a heart and that the heart was of Middle Eastern descent? Did they make a DNA test? Did they guess? Or did they shout miracle and move on with their life? And are there, I don't know, police reports, autopsies or investigations about these human pieces of heart suddenly showing up? There is a lot of missing data and details that are rather important that you completely left out. And even if I would take all of the things you told me at face value, which I don't obviously, that still wouldn't explain the weirdest part of it all. Which is, why the hell would there only be a piece of a heart and not the whole thing? The Jesus gets stingy. And why would that piece of heart be horribly beaten? When a guy gets beaten up, you expect head injuries, broken ribs, pierced lungs, torn nerves, inner bleedings, you expect about everything. Except what you don't expect is a pulpified heart. Because the heart is one of the best protected organs in your entire body. And so it makes zero sense that it would be beaten up. It also makes zero sense in context of the story. Because in the story itself, Jesus was still having a chat while on the cross. That is not something a horribly beaten and assaulted heart is very good at. So please do feel free to explain and hold yourself to your own standards. That's the good side. But on the bad side, if, if you were an exorcist and you watch someone levitate off a couch, and I can't put that into the DSM manual classification of a psychological disorder, you'd have to say something's happening here. There might be something beyond what I believe. Well, that is one possible takeaway, another would be that you're seeing things that aren't really there. At last I checked, hallucinations are included in the Diagnostics and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, DSM in short. Of course, there is a possibility that someone really is just flying around the ceiling and you're not hallucinating. But in such cases, you couldn't just go, it's the devil, either. You have to actually find out what is going on. Is it real? Or are you being deceived? Is Graham upstairs vacuuming again? <laughs> just kidding. But the bottom line is this. You can't just jump to God did it. Uh, I mean, the devil did it. You have to actually find the concrete cause. What is the mechanism? How does it work? Why does it work? Saying this is weird, therefore my dogma is correct, is not research. It is not intellectually honest. It is wishful thinking and confirmation bias. So I would say maybe do your research a little more before you come to that conclusion. Yes, exactly. Do your research. And while you're at it, next time take a camera with you and film it. 
Because who knows, others might see something that you don't, or not see something that you do. One never knows. <laughs>